All right. <clears throat> good morning. Uh, good morning. I am not Pastor David. Oh, man. <laughs> Sorry, Dave, if you're listening. That's not nice. No, Dave, as we uh, announced a couple weeks ago, is on a six-week, we're calling it a rest and refresh period. So uh, as, as Jake was just mentioning, um, I don't know if head pastor is the hardest job during a pandemic, but it's up there. It's up there. He's earned it. We're so excited that he has this period to just uh, relax. He's up there in Estes Park right now with Anita, so we're really excited about that. Uh, I am Jeff. Uh, I'm part of the elder team here at Pinecrest, uh, and uh, this is not my day job. <laughs> but I am really excited about what I got to share with you all this morning. Um, so would you pray with me? Father God, just thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for gathering us all here. Just so we have the opportunity to do this again, Lord. Thank you just for this place. I pray for everyone here that you would give them ears to hear uh, your word. And I pray that you would just help me to convey it faithfully, Lord. So we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're starting a new series. Uh, we're going to be doing this for the next several weeks. It's called Hills to Die On. Keeping the first things first. <clears throat> and so that's a saying that we're all pretty familiar with, right? Hills to die on. Uh, I want to share one of my hills to die on first. The setting is a Starbucks about 13 years ago outside of Philadelphia. I am enjoying a nice burnt cup of coffee <laughs> with my then brand new girlfriend, uh, now wife, Heather. And so we're at the point where I don't even know if you would say it's like boyfriend, girlfriend yet. We're just getting to know each other, right? So, of course, I do what every 19-year-old young man from New England would do, and I pop the question, are you a Yankees fan? <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, so she's from New York, and I'm from Connecticut, and I'm a huge Red Sox fan, and so this is a deal breaker for me if she's a Yankees fan. I mean, this might fall on some deaf ears here in Colorado. I'm gonna try to help you out. It's sorta of like Broncos Raiders, right, sorta, of, but like it's worse than that. And so, so, I, so I ask her, guys, I wish I was kidding. This is a true story. So I ask her, is she a Yankees fan? And she says to me, I'm really not into baseball. <laughs> Which was not, also not the answer I was looking for, but we can work with that, right? I, really, looking back on it now, I'm just lucky she didn't just like get up out of that Starbucks, walk away, and never talk to me again. So I came out of that ahead. It's a hill to die on. But the, the saying, hill to die on, uh, right, it's a military uh, thing at first, right? It's a, it's a military saying. It's, is this literal hill a place that is literally worth dying on for us to capture this hill, right, the battle? So here's another battle. It's, it was called Hamburger Hill. Uh, this was a battle in the Vietnam War. It was fought by the U.S. Army and their South Vietnamese allies against the People's Army of Vietnam. It was from May 10th to May 20th, 1969. And at the time, the U.S. had a policy called maximum pressure. And the idea was to just fight, attack, attack, attack. Wherever we are, we're going to fight, we're going to fight, we're going to fight. And so it brought them to this place called Hamburger Hill. The terrain, this is an actual picture, the terrain uh, is an extremely dense jungle. Uh, it was not just a hill, it was a mountain. You can see some soldiers uh, climbing up it right there. And if you've ever climbed a 14er in Colorado and you've taken a picture of like, where you've climbed from, you know that's steep, right? So imagine trying to fight a battle going up a 14er. So that's basically the situation they found themselves in. During the 10-day battle, uh, U.S. troops scaled the hill, and they did capture it eventually. But it came at the cost of great loss of life. Uh, it was a meat grinder, and that's actually how it got the name Hamburger Hill. The soldiers climbing the hill reduced to hamburger is what it came, why it was called that. Pretty rough. To take the position, the 101st Airborne Division com, uh, and rest of Army committed five infantry battalions, ten batteries of ar artillery, the U.S. Air Force flew 272 missions, 
and expended over a million pounds of explosives. During the 10-day battle, there were 372 U.S. soldiers wounded and 72 killed. U.S. forces then abandoned the hill June 5th, just two weeks after it was captured. General Melvin Zeiss afterwards would comment, that hill had no military value whatsoever. We found the enemy on Hill 937, and we fought him there. Really quite sad when you think about it. So flip back 25 years earlier to, a, to another battle. This is Normandy, right? World War II, uh, June 6, 1944, D-Day, right? Maybe one of the most important battles ever fought in the history of the world. Uh, it was primarily U.S., British, and Canadian troops that would invade the beaches of German-occupied France. The topography there was also very challenging. They, would, they disembarked on this beach, and there's a long beach, and then you'd see there's just cliffs, right? And then where there wasn't cliffs, you can see here, it's kind of like a bowl shape where there's, it's a really steep hill. So again, this is literally an actual hill battle, right? In preparation for the battle, Captain Scott Bowden uh, said to General Omar Bradley, Sir, I hope you don't mind me saying it, but this beach is a very formidable position. Indeed, there are bound to be tremendous casualties. Bradley put his hand on Scott Bowden's shoulder and replied, I know, my boy, I know. <clears throat> um, during these, this battle, there was 10,000 Allied casualties and 4,400 Allied deaths. But you'd be hard-pressed to find any war historian who would say that D-Day was a bad decision. It was unfortunate. It was certainly not something we celebrate, but it was important. And so all analogies are flawed, right? And so I just want to be honest with you. Generally, I'm not a huge fan of the like, military and faith thing analogies. It's just not my thing. But the, what I'm trying to get across here is that wisdom and discernment on deciding when to fight and when to keep the peace is vitally important. All right. The same is true for our various doctrines of the faith we hold so dear. We need to be thoughtful and calculated about where we draw our line in the sand. Good. Come on. And if we're being honest, historically, Christians were not really been that great at this. Many churches end up on one of two extremes, right? There's the ones that hold every doctrine with a tight fist. And if we disagree on anything at all, you're the heretic, I'm right, right? And on the other hand, there is the just love Jesus crowd, which I'll call minimalism here. Right? If you just love Jesus, everything will work itself out. But before I point out the problems with these things, there's a reason why we end up on one of these two extremes, too. Right? If we're being honest with ourselves, both of these camps have good reasons behind them. Um, the first, for the fundamentalist side, is generally speaking, they're valuing truth, specifically God's truth. Right? So 2 Timothy 3.16 uh, this is in the ESV version. I've got it on the screen for you here, uh, if you don't have that version. It says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And so generally people who are holding everything with a tight fist, they're holding on to this concept, which totally cosign, right? We all believe this, right? All scripture is God-breathed and valuable, and we need to hold on to all truth. But sometimes we go too far. Did you know fundamentalism, right? Sometimes that term nowadays has a little bit of a negative tinge to it, right? But did you know that it started with the idea of the fundamentals of the Christian faith? It uh, arose a little over 100 years ago, and it was a reaction to the other side that was attacking the real core ideas of Christianity. And they had a, an acronym of how to remember all of these things, and it was called MARVIN, right? And so the first one was M, was miracles, that... Jesus' miracles actually happened, right? They weren't, they, they weren't fake. They weren't, at this time, 100 years ago, science was trying to disprove all of this. And so they were saying, no, miracles are true. Yeah. 
the atonement of Christ, right? That Jesus died to take our place and he took the punishment for our sins. The resurrection, Jesus' physical body rose from the grave. The virgin birth is necessary for Jesus to be both fully human and fully God. And then uh, both I and N, the inerrancy of Scripture, that the Bible is completely true and without error in its original manuscripts. Right? And so if you're going to call that fundamentalism, then sign me up. Right? It sounds pretty good. Um, so I'm on board. And so it's this valuing of truth is the reason why we, we fall on this extreme sometimes. Right? On the flip side, the doctrinal minimalists a lot of times are valuing unity of the church. Right? Again, extremely important. Something that we want to cling on to. Did you know that for the first thousand years of Christianity, there was one denomination, right? Now, you're here, I'm here, so you agree that that didn't really work out very well, <laughs> right? Um, you, you'd be at a different church if you thought that there should still only be one. But there's some positives to that, right? That was, then, around the year 1000 was the great schism between the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, right? And then for the next 500 years, it was just those two denominations, Right? And then the Reformation happened, which is why we're all here. And then there were six denominations, more or less. You could argue a couple extra, but it basically went up to six, right? By the year 1900, that number had risen to 1900. And as we stand here today, the number is 45,000 global denominations. Guys. I don't know if number one is the right number, but 45,000 is not, <laughs> right? Oh, gosh. Who here uh, has played the game Apples to Apples, right? M most of you? Okay. Uh, keep your hand raised if you like the game Apples to Apples. Okay, yeah, most of you. I hate that game. <laughs> it's like, it is the worst game ever. So, for, I mean, I think most people play it, but for, if you haven't played it, the idea is you have cards and you have to match this subject card in the middle, right? And then someone picks this is the best subject card, and then you're the winner, right? So here's my problem, is you could, like, the subject card could be blue, and, like, I, I got the sky, right? I'm going to play the sky. And so, like, I win, right? Because that the sky is blue. I'm the winner of apples to apples. No, no. It's whoever, if the person whose turn it is doesn't like that that's the answer, then you lose. And that's the way it is. I hate the game so much. <laughs> so... Good news is there's this new game. Um, there's like a spin-off of it, and uh, it's probably they, they copyright problems here. But it's called Stuff Christians Like, and it's kind of like apples to apples, but all the cards are like stereotypical things about Christians, and so um, it's really funny. I co-sign on the game. Uh, there's a couple that are like, oof, that hit a little too close. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but so we're, we're playing this the other day, all right? And so this is, I don't know if you can read this, this is the subject card. It says, every church should have at least one Sunday morning dedicated to, and then you've got to fill in the blank, right? So this, this is what someone play, played. Trash talking other churches. <laughs> oh. Oh. I mean, it's supposed to be funny, guys, but it ended up in the game. Like, that means that we got a bit of a reputation here. Oh, laugh so you don't cry. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is, that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Paul's begging the church here in Corinthians, be united. There's no divisions among you. Be of the same mind. And then you see all these, I follow so-and-so. Sounds a lot like the denominations, doesn't it? Then in John 17, verse 11, this is coming up towards the end of Jesus' life, right? And he's praying to God the Father. And he prays for us. He prays for his church, his followers. He says in John 11, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. That we're as close as Jesus is to God the Father. 
Jesus apparently thought it was important enough for us to be united to pray about it. And he goes on in that same chapter down in verse 22. He says, The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Do you get that from Jesus? He's saying that the unity of the church is proof that Jesus was sent by God and that God loves the world. That's how important this is. This is something that we can't just say, oh, it'd be nice if we could get along. I hope we can get along. No, it needs to be a priority. So you can see why people fall on one of these two extremes, because both of those things are important. But here's the problems, right? The problems with fundamentalism. The first one's pride. Listen, if you have a sense of superiority based on what you think you know, that's an issue. It's sinful. Thinking that you're above someone because of your knowledge, it's probably misinformed. 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and 2 says, We know that all of us possess knowledge, and this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This is my favorite one. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to. Ain't that the truth, right? So it can lead to pride. The other one, kind of like what we talked about, it can lead to division, right? Fundamentalism leads to division. When you fight over everything, every little thing, that's how you end up with 45,000 denominations. In Titus, the whole point of the book of Titus, actually, is Paul is sending Titus to Crete because there's false teachers there. And so he wants people, he wants him to set up leaders that will teach sound doctrine, right? That's kind of the theme of the book. But he says this in, in Titus 3, 9. He says, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for the person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. This is a really serious issue to Paul. He says, do not be that person who stirs up division and quarrels over the small things. The big things are what's important. The flip side, the problems with minimalism. Well, first of all, it's impossible to have no doctrine, right? That's just right off the bat, this, this position is impossible. Um, it sounds intriguing at first, just love Jesus. Okay, I'm on board, sounds good, right? But even that is a doctrine, right? Just the, the saying, just love Jesus, that's a doctrine. And if you say, just love Jesus, well then, who is Jesus? Is he a man? Was he God? Was he both? If you say, just love him, what does it mean to love him? Does it mean just have positive feelings about him? Does it mean that I need to follow his commandments? If so, what are they? And what do they mean? And so really quickly, even just the statement, just love Jesus, leads you down a whole line of questions about doctrine, right? right. Another reason it's impossible is because the heart cannot love what the mind cannot know. The heart cannot love what the mind cannot know. So if you, if you know my wife, um, she... <laughs> She's nervous now. No, don't be. Uh, if you know my wife, uh, so she's a words of affirmation person, right? So you know the five love languages? She's a words of affirmation person. And so I understand that most of the time. And so it would not be uncommon for her to just be like, just tell me something nice, right? <laughs> what? She hasn't said this specifically, but imagine. What? Why do you think I'm pretty? Right? She has not said that, to be clear. <laughs> and if I said that, and, I, and if I responded to Heather and I said, you know, it's just, you have the most beautiful auburn dark hair. It just shimmers. It's so pretty. And your hazel eyes are just, they, they leave me spe speechless every time. Okay, some of you are getting really uncomfortable right now. <laughs> right? And it's because you know that my wife is, has blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> right? And so if, if you heard me say those things about Heather, you would be, you'd be like, do you even know her? Like, how can you love her if you don't even know her? <laughs> I'd be well, first of all, that's a good point. I'd be dead if I said that, right? We wouldn't be having this conversation. But if I did, you'd be like, do you even know your wife? Right? 
if we don't know God, how can we say we love him? Amen. Right? So just love Jesus is impossible if you're not searching the scriptures for who he is. A second problem is it can lead to serious error. Galatians 1.9, Paul says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Whew, that's heavy. I mean, these are important things. The gospel, I mean, specifically, Paul's talking about the gospel here. Don't get that wrong, he says. May you be cursed if you get that wrong. Now, I'm not talking about mental ascent, like we all don't have to be perfect in our knowledge, but he's talking about people who are trying to trick you with false information, right? These are important things. And so the idea of just love Jesus can lead to serious error. And so here's the other one. If the last one seemed like a little bit intimidating, this one is just, I'm trying to help you out. You miss out if that is your attitude. There are so many truths in the Bible that God wanted us to know, and if we just take it for granted, you miss out. Asking, what do I need to be, what is the bare minimum I need to know about God to be saved is like asking, what must I eat to survive, right? The, the answer is not much, right? You could just eat a bowl of oatmeal every day and you last for a long time, but you're really missing out. Similarly, the gospel is really simple and praise God that the gospel is, sim is simple, right? Awesome. That is so awesome. But you are saved by grace through faith is not the whole entirety of what this says. God had other things that he wanted us to know. Just think, for example, the idea that God is good and that God is sovereign, that he's in control, right? Two simple characteristics of God. Those things, we can say them here today when everything's going really well and just say, oh yeah, that's doctrine. I mean, thanks, Jeff, that's nice. But in the dark moments of your life, when you need something to cling on to, that, those truths are so important. I, you can have so much peace just by the idea that God is good and that he's in control. Am I right? Yes. And so there's issues with both of these things, right? Fundamentalism, we're valuing truth. That's great. Minimalism, we're valuing unity. That's great. But there's problems on both sides. And so the question is, am I saying meet in the middle or compromise? In the words of the great Michael Scott, compromise is not ideal. <laughs> so we are not going to compromise. That is not what I'm suggesting at all. What I'm saying is that there is a third better option, right? J. Gresham Machen, uh, he was the author of Christianity and Liberalism. And so this is one of those, we'll call them founding fathers of fundamentalism, right? So this is a guy who is not going to compromise, right? He knows what he believes and he's sticking to it. But this is what he said. We do not mean in insisting upon the doctrinal basis of Christianity that all points of doctrine are equally important. It is perfectly possible for Christian fellowship to be maintained despite differences in opinion. Again, this is the guy who like, founded the fundamentalist movement, one of them, right? So he's not like wishy-washy. But he's saying, listen, not everything is of equal importance. And I think we get this, right? We understand this in everyday life. Um, so this is a, a recent photograph of myself and my wonderful seven-year-old son, Ben, just crushing some sushi. <laughs> so we went out to sushi uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I think it was actually for Easter. We didn't feel like cooking some for Easter, so we're going to go get a bunch of sushi. Um, and no, we did not invite our entire family. Uh, that giant pile of sushi is for me, my wife, and my seven-year-old. Uh, and if you're into sushi, you know that that's too much sushi. Right, uh, pretty much, and so, which, which Alyssa Shaw um, um, sarcastically pointed out immediately, I'm not so sure that's enough sushi for two adults and a seven-year-old, right? Yeah, real funny. Well, okay, so here's the thing. She was right. <laughs> um, uh, did, I, did I not eat it all? No, I ate it all, right? I ate most of it. Um, and what happened? Uh, it's called a sushi coma. After you eat that much sushi, you just go lay down and have a nap, and then you wake up, and your stomach still doesn't feel good, and you just feel kind of fat for the next couple days. And that's what happened, right? And so we know, we know this with, with food. You eat too much, bad things happen. And if you don't eat enough food, also bad things happen, 
Like, being thoughtful about the middle ground is a better option. It's not a compromise, right? We, sleep is the same thing, right? You, you, miss, you don't sleep well, you feel terrible the whole rest of the day. But who has slept like 12 hours and been like, oof, that was a bad choice. And then you feel really terrible the rest of the day. Again, it's this middle ground. Exercise is the same thing. The middle ground is, is better. It's not a compromise. And so what do I mean by that? So I got rid of the extremes, right? The spectrum. See what I did there? Kind of made it a hill, right? So we have on one side of the hill, the minimalism. On the other side of the hill, fundamentalism. And so they value unity, but not really. Fundamentalism, truth, but not always. And we're going to get into that real quick. The middle is finding the right hills to die on, right? And here's the benefit of doing that. The first one is meaningful unity. When you don't know where anyone stands, and there's a million and one positions, what really unites you, right? The absence of division is not the same as meaningful unity, right? The absence of division is not the same as meaningful unity. Minimalism creates the absence of division. We're not going to fight over anything, so there's no division, because we're just not going to stand for anything. But that's not meaningful unity. When when you think of like athletes when they retire and they have that press conference, right? And there's, they're in tears, oh, there's no more football, oh my gosh, right? What do they always say was the thing that they're going to miss the most? The bros. The bros. They're going to miss that team chemistry, right? And team chemistry comes from a united goal. They know their objective, they know that they're with each other, and they're bound together to achieve it. Similarly, when we identify the foundations of our faith, we know this is what we believe. There's unity that's achieved in that that couldn't be achieved otherwise. That's good. Ephesians 4, 9 through 14 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain a unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. See, to Paul here, true unity is unity in our faith, that we believe the same things, that we identify what we believe, and that we are no longer tricked by every wind of a wave of doctrine. That's what true unity is in the church. The second thing is boldness and truth, right? It's important that we identify the foundations of what we believe because then there's no confusion. Alexander Hamilton said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Uh, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John heal a paraplegic man, and he walks, and then they're arrested, right? Can't do that. No healing people. Right? So then in Acts 4 through 8, it says this. Then, so they're on trial now. Right? This is Peter on trial in front of the people who have arrested him. He says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done by, to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's the gospel right there. And man, like these are the people that arrested him. They're in, they're in it deep. But they had such boldness. They didn't just say, sorry, please don't kill us. With boldness and conviction, they laid down what they believe. If you don't know and hold fast to the, the core thoughts of our, script, of, our, of our faith, how would you ever have this kind of boldness? There's no other way to have this kind of boldness but to identify these things and to hold on to them with all we have. The last thing that finding the right hills to die on leads to is grace and humility in our diversity. We must have boldness to proclaim the truths of certain things, but we need to have the humility to know where our knowledge ends. And grace for Christians who see things differently. 
Uh, John Newton was the author of Amazing Grace, right? Maybe the most well-known hymn of all time, so beautiful. But he wrote other things too. And he wrote one thing um, called uh, On Controversy. And he wrote this about a fellow believer whom you see things differently. He wrote, The Lord loves him and bears with him, and therefore you must not despise him or treat him harshly. The Lord bears with you likewise and expects that you should show tenderness to others from a sense of the much forgiveness you need yourself. In a little while, you will meet that person in heaven and he will be dearer to you than the nearest friend you have upon earth. Anticipate that period in your thoughts. And though you may find it necessary to oppose his errors today, view him personally as a kindred soul with whom you are to be happy in Christ forever. I'll say it again because I just liked it so much. 1 Corinthians 8.2 If anyone imagines he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to. <laughs> Romans 14, uh, Paul talks about this too. He gives, a, gives us a, a clear example, right? He says, <clears throat> and they're talking about dietary laws, right, and what to eat. And this doesn't really strike a chord with us because we don't really have that as much today, but this was really a, kind of a big deal in this day and age, right? And so Paul writes, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? And then down further in the chapter, he says, so let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. So we need to have grace and humility and room for disagreements on some of the smaller things. So what does this look like? Right, I want to put a little meat to the bones, right? And so this is where things get a little more personal, right? So just be warned. <laughs> but the, 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 I put it into four tiers, and, and a lot of this is based, shameless plug, based on a book by Gavin, Dr. Gavin Ortland. Uh, it's called Finding the Right Hills to Die On. Uh, great book. So uh, shameless plug, if you like what you're hearing here this morning, go buy that book. It's really good. But he puts it into four tiers, right? And so this fourth tier is what I'm calling the hamburger hill, right? These are the things that are outside of scripture, and we just need to forget about them when it comes to the body of Christ. Do you know that if you, if you Google uh, church split over, the first thing that pops up is carpet color, <laughs> right? Uh, now, does that really happen? I don't know, but we've all heard it before, right? <clears throat> church split over carpet, carpet culture. Uh, carpet culture? Carpet color. <laughs> carpet culture. That's a new thing. I just coined that right here, right now. Um, that one's funny, right? Do you know what the third thing is on the list on Google's autofill? Face masks. Ugh, that's not as funny. I gotta tell you guys, the reason that Dave needs rest and refresh is not the first tier issues, it's these fourth tier issues, right? Other things, music style, music volume, politics. I'm not saying these things aren't important, I'm saying they're less important than the church and the body of Christ. They're fourth tier issues and you can have opinions by all means, but never divide over them. Like, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ are more important than these things. And so these fourth tier issues we just need to forget about. So then the third tier. These are things that are important. They are important, but don't divide over them. These are the things that we find in Scripture, right? So example would be one that falls here, um, the creation account, right? Genesis 1 and 2. There's many people who believe that is literal and that God created in seven days. There are many people who believe that God created over millions of years, right? Um, there, there has to be a right answer, right? There's literally something happened. I don't know which one it is, and I'm not here to convince you of one way or the other. But there is a right answer, right? Um, and it's, it's because God put it in Scripture, it's our responsibility to search it out and find the right answer and come to a conclusion for ourselves, right? Here's the thing. We believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, Completely, hard stop, inerrancy of scripture. What isn't inerrant is our interpretation of it. There you go. Right? right? And so here's the thing. There's these third tier issues where they're important and they're in scripture and so we should search out the answer, but we shouldn't divide over it because real Christian believers, 
who honestly are trying to faithfully read the Bible can come to a different conclusion than you. And your interpretation is not inerrant. And so we got to know, maybe we're right, we, we think we're right, because that's our position, but we could be wrong. And so we should never divide over these things as a church. Churches have divided over the over creation account. They have, right? People have left churches over that all the time. And it just shouldn't happen. The second tier, <clears throat> these things are so important that they lead to separation. But they're still fellow Christians. So an example here would be baptism, right? In this church, we baptize believers. If you come to a believing faith in Christ, then you are welcome to be baptized anytime here, and I encourage that if you haven't, right? Um, there are a lot of Christian churches, in fact, the majority, that baptize babies of believing parents. They just, as soon as there's a baby born, oh, baptize, boom, all right? That gets a little awkward, right? So let's imagine one of those Christians came here and was like, came up to Pastor Dave and said, hey, I'd like you to baptize my baby. And Dave's like, uh, no, <laughs> right? Things, things get a little awkward, right? And so unfortunately, maybe it's best that they worship at the Presbyterian church down the street, and we worship here. And that's kind of sad, but the main point here is they're still Christians, right? These are still brothers and sisters in Christ. And so these things we think are super important, and we're not really going to budge on them, and this is how our church operates. But we know that you're still a believer, and so they shouldn't be treated as otherwise. These are still our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're physically separated, but we're not spiritually separated. And so that leads us to the first tier. And this is what we're going to be talking about in this series <clears throat> for the next seven weeks or so. These are the core issues of our faith. We must hold on to these. Without these, our faith starts to fall apart. These are the things that we can't give an inch on. right? This is the beaches of Normandy. Even if it leads to something less than ideal, we can't move on these things. And so what are they, right? This is not an exhaustive list, but this is what we're going to be talking about here uh, in the next couple weeks. The Bible, right? That it is inerrant and it is authoritative. We're going to talk about God the Father, who he is, what are his characteristics, who is God? Sin. Yeah. What, what's the day on that one? Are you going to skip that one? No. <laughs> Just kidding. I think Chip's doing that one and it's going to be awesome, so please come. It, it's reality, right? And, it, and the problem of sin. Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and I didn't put it there, should say his return, right? That his, he is both divine and human. These th are things that are core to our faith. Salvation, that it is by grace through faith. The Holy Spirit, who he is, his personhood and his work, what he does. And then the Trinity, that God is three in one. Again, maybe not exhaustive, but it's the things that we're going to hit on. So what do we do? What do we do with this, right? Well, the first thing is decide what are the right hills to die on. And by that, I don't mean what is your truth, right? <laughs> we just went over it. There, there, there are these things that we are here to help and that we're going to be talking about the next seven weeks. But what I mean is that you could just come here and listen to all these things, but you personally need to decide, yes, I believe this is a hill to die on for me. Like you need to make that choice yourself and hold on to these things. It's a personal voyage. So that's the first thing. We're going to decide what are the right hills to die on. And then finally, we're going to live like you would die on those hills, right? So I, I wrestled with whether to bring up this point earlier, uh, decided to not, but all these ideas of like hills to die on, it can lead to the idea of fighting, right? It's not about fighting. It's about living like you would die on those hills, right? It's not about fighting. It's about living, how you live. And so I wrestled with, you know, just a, a story or something to illustrate to this to you guys. Um, but, you know, when I stop and think about it, we, we, don't, we don't need a new story or a new example, right? Jesus literally died on a literal hill, and he did so without fighting. But he won, Right? Jesus literally died on a literal hill without fighting, but he won. The night before he was crucified, Jesus prayed to God, God, please take this cup from me. But he was so convicted of the will of God the Father that he was willing to die for it. That was a hill he literally was willing to die for. And so that's our example. We don't need a better example than that. Amen?
Amen. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity this morning. Thank you for this group. Thank you for uh, the men that are coming the next several weeks to, to teach on your word and these core values of the faith, Lord. I pray for everyone here that they would have, have open ears for this, that we would grab onto these truths and live with them with conviction, just as Jesus Christ did for us. I thank you, Father, for that, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are dismissed.